Um, but the, the biggest thing in the beginning was just kind of laying down framework. A lot of it was just, you know, five guys in a server together playing Valorant. And we kind of sat down and approached it like, how do we want to approach every map? How do we want to structure our defaults? What is the objective when we're going fast? What are we doing when we're going slow? What are we doing? Just kind of laying that framework for how we were going to build the team moving forward. And I think a lot of those fundamentals that we laid in the early days, you know, back when it was just, you know, even before we did or right as we did join and it was still brand new and we were, you know, sitting in uh, a custom lobby in Haven, for example, looking, looking at our 131 defaults, you know, like some of that stuff we still do today. I mean, it's just frameworks that we've layered and layered and layered on top of. So I think just getting a, a good solid head start on that early and starting to lay that down was really what allowed us to continue rolling forward. Uh, yeah, my internet is shite, but that's fine because um, my, my guests aren't. We, we're we're going to roll straight on into this here. Uh, obviously, et cetera, a team that have really impressed us for quite a while, right? Late last year, they were putting in the grind in a lot of like these monthly tournaments. They were, I think they were a part of the Complexity 10K. They were in the Winter Championships, right? All of a sudden, this team really starts to come alive and everyone is talking about x right? right? They, they're showing us like this incredible communication, this coordination, at least displayed in game. They've bringing a brand of Valorant that we're not really seeing from anyone else. So we want to know all about that. Uh, this isn't the first uh, Valorant podcast that Psycho's been on, but we're glad to have him here. So we want to welcome Coach of Exet, Don Psycho Meyer. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Glad to be here. Ah, oh, listen, I mean, we're glad we could secure you, man. I'm sure you guys have been busy, busy. I mean, you've had a little bit of break, obviously, as you guys have already well and truly qualified uh, at this stage for Challengers Finals, but you'll be building into that. We want to know a little bit about your background personally, because you know, for, for maybe people who only followed Valorant, maybe they're not really familiar with, you know, yourself or even the brand that is Xset and, uh, you know, maybe what your what your goal and mission was in Valorant. Sure. So my, my background is pretty diverse. Um, you know, I, I did competitive gaming back in high school and a little bit of college. I uh, played some America's Army, COD 4, Black Ops. America's Army. Yeah, yeah, bringing it back. So, um, you know, I, I went into college, started doing college things, uh, playing in bands, uh, you know, touring in bands, uh, working IT jobs. So I kind of got away from gaming for a while. Um, and then a couple years ago, Battalion 1944 came out, which kind of pulled a lot of those, you know, old COD 4 players back into it. Mm -hmm. um, was playing a little bit of that. Uh, and then we heard Valorant was coming out. Um, so one of these battalion teams hit me up and said, hey, I heard you were talking about, you know, maybe wanting to do coaching. And I said, yeah, you know, sure, screw it. Like, I'll, I'll try coaching. It sounds like something I'd be very good at. I really like it. Uh, developing players and you know my aim's not what it was when I was a high school kid so you know sounds like a good path for me so uh, Valorant came out in beta and I was you know helping these battalion 1944 guys from sedated, uh, sedated team, yep. Yep, yep. transition over yep. um, and we were doing pretty well I was really enjoying it um, but that team kind of died out we had trouble getting like a solid five together um, and everything was so like volatile early on nobody know, knew who was good who was bad etc mm -hmm. so um, that team kind of fell apart and me and Wilski went from there over to Lazarus. Um, so at that point in time, I was coaching Lazarus part-time, um, still working the IT job at Microsoft as a support engineer. Um, and you just, you know, staying very busy. Um, but then, uh, Lazarus kind of petered out, uh, and, uh, I did a tier two team Genesis with a bunch of ranked players. Uh, I just kind of like threw a team together with Profi, Chemicals, a couple other guys, Nosy. Um, and then after that, I was contacted by a trial manager for Pretty Boys, who was led by Thwaifo, who was signed by Xset, mm -hmm. um, who was tasked by to put a team together. And they kind of hit me up and said, look, you know, we got this team. I'm, I'm putting them together. We're trying to get, you know, signed by Xset. And uh, we just feel like we've hit a plateau. We need some help busting through. And I said, you know, sounds good. Perfect. Bring me in. Um, so we started, you know, piecing together the final pieces. We brought in We Did. Um, secured Pure R, who had kind of been wandering away from us over to Immortals, would be snatched him back in. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, awesome. we, had, we had a pretty good run, so. Yeah, and it continues to be pretty good, actually, so far, Psycho. So uh, just to get back onto it, too, because you said, basically, uh, that was my question, looking back of how you, you got about with Pretty Boys and Exit, and I guess it was, you know, the Pretty Boys already uh destined or or in a, in a project to try to get something done and, and start the exit division for uh valorant and 
if they brought you in, you're like, okay, I'll give it a shot, but you're still trying to figure out like the right pieces. What flaws or what gaps did you notice so far from the get go with Pretty Boys, and how did you how did you piece it together to say we might need this, we might need that? What goes in through your mindset for this? Oh, that was a while back. So when I came in, the the biggest the biggest issue was you know we really only had like a core three between uh, Twyfo Brando and mm -hmm. uh, Aaron, and Aaron, Pure R obviously was trialing with Immortals, and we had uh, another guy, um, and so. The issue was, you know, we have all these pieces. What are these pieces doing? How do they mesh together? Uh, and just kind of figuring that over the course of about a month. And then after that, I was able to kind of identify, okay, these are the pieces that are missing. Um, so we brought in uh, we did and kind of secured that that final five. And we were doing pretty well with Brando. Um, but the, the biggest thing in the beginning was just kind of laying down framework. A lot of it was just, you know, five guys in a server together playing Valorant. And we kind of sat down and approach it like how do we want to approach every map how do we want to structure our defaults what is the objective when we're going fast what are we doing when we're going slow what are we doing just kind of laying that framework for how we were going to build the team moving forward and i think a lot of those fundamentals that we laid in the early days you know back when it was just you know even before we did or right as we did join and it was still brand new and we were you know sitting in uh a custom lobby in haven for example looking looking at our 131 defaults you know like some of that stuff we still do today I mean, it's just frameworks that we've layered and layered and layered on top of. So I think just getting a, a good, solid head start on that early and starting to lay that down was really what allowed us to continue rolling forward. Actually, I wanted to know about your approach, more of your approach in the game. You know, you spoke about uh, having this sort of vision and finding your missing pieces. But of course, with the game, like we got new maps, new agents, buffs, um, nerfs, like happening all the time. And I'm sure, you know, as well, like, it feels like the secret of staying consistent is being flexible, you know, uh, and uh, being able to accept the meta that's changing and developing. And in terms of that, with Astra coming in, what do you think is the best approach with this agent right now? Because over here in Europe, a lot of teams are playing Astra. A lot of teams are doing very, very, very different things with her. Uh, so yeah, I just wanted to know what you think the best and most effective approach is with this agent. Sure. So when Astra came out, we were still in the final stages of ECT1. So we were kind of playing on those old patches. We didn't get to jump into her as early as we wanted. But the minute we were able to, and you know, even before then, I was kind of playing her on my own and ranked and kind of seeing what she could do in custom servers. And it was like, to me, it was the, the impact that she brought um, and the value that she added over even an omen uh, was immediate. And I knew that we had to work her into our comp on almost every map. So as soon as we got the chance to do so, uh, we brought her in. Um, she really, she she's oppressive, man, especially on defense. Mm. Um, just the ability to control zones and choke points um, and slow down the timing of the other teams is is really oppressive. And her utility combos so well with uh, just about any other agent that does, does damage or any sort of impact. So um, we just kind of worked her in, um, started looking at how do we want to use her, where are we going to put her, what agents are we going to put her near? And then watching how she kind of organically flowed with these agents and then kind of picking out, okay, that's good. Uh, let's do that more. Okay, this is good too. Let's do that more. How can we combine these things? This and that. Uh, what about the way that she's paired with Viper as well? Because obviously some people are going to think that's a bit of an overkill. You don't need that kind of dynamic. And some people, uh, you know, with you guys having such a good Viper player, do you feel like that's also the way forward? Um, I think right now, uh, Viper's in an interesting spot. Uh, she's obviously been buffed to the point where it's almost absurd not to use her, uh, but you still can't on most maps use her as the sole controller uh, because of the way that she works. Obviously, when you throw your wall down and your orb, if they're not in a place where you can pick up the orb, and obviously you can't pick up the wall at all, you know, you're kind of committed to that bomb site. So say you're, you know, taking A on split, you throw your wall and your orb down. And they know now, it's now you gotta, right? Yeah, you get stuffed and now you got to go B, but now you got, you don't have smokes, you don't have anything to cover choke points at B, so... You have to have that omen or that astra to kind of offset her. Um, on Icebox, you can get away with that more um, with her as a solo controller. But yeah, I think right now, uh, comboing Astra and Viper or omen and Viper for people who aren't comfortable with Astra, you're going to see a lot of that right now until uh, you know the nerfs come in. 
So I want to talk a little bit about uh, ch challenges one, right? Because you know this is the, you know Exit obviously really starting to get a lot of respect from people over the last couple of months, right? As as a team, I think one thing that uh, which I'll touch on later is people are so impressed about how incredibly quick your retakes are. You guys are like just on the spot, just making things happen, and you never really seem to be under time pressure as a result of that. But for the first time in a challenges, you actually win your first matchup. Quite often, you actually had to fight in the lower bracket for you know for a lot of these, but. So you, you end up beating BBG, and then you have to go up against Envy. <laughs> like after you win your first game, you're up against Envy. Now, you play them twice over the course of, of, of this tournament. And one thing I always love is hearing from, you know, coaches or teams uh, uh, that they play against a top opponent like this on two occasions. Now, you get, you get two woes in that first match, but you end up coming back in the lower bracket to beat them. Um, I want to talk through a little bit. I don't know if it's going back too far now, but... So like, what is the thinking process in between those two games? Or what do you think you changed? What did you learn from that first Envy game that allowed you to just walk back in and honestly just look unbelievable? Uh, you know, obviously it was a banger of a series. Uh, it's like 13 nines, I think all the way through, but you guys end up triumphing and that's just like a huge statement. It's like, we're, we're really here now. We're really a top team. I just want to know what happened in between. Um, well, obviously we played Envy quite a bit. Um, even going back to, like you said, Complexity 10K, we played them and then... Right after that, NSG 25K winter, we played them twice. They were in our groups. Uh, we've got matched up against Envy. I don't know. I'm, this obviously isn't based on numbers, but I feel like more than just about any other team that we play at that level. Sure. Um, and so they know us really well. We know them very well. Um, and it's, it's a really close matchup, but we feel like they, they edge us out a lot more than we're able to edge them out. So whenever we go up against them, we try to uh, look at that in that light and kind of you know, what's our counter strategy going in? What are we going to deal with on their end? Um, you know, our counter strategy going into the first matchup obviously didn't pay off. Uh, oh. We got bumped down into the lower bracket by them, but then had to play them again in that lower bracket run. Um, we played them on split, I think, first, and uh, we, we felt pretty confident um, with our news. We had a new comp that they hadn't seen yet in the previous matchup. Mm -hmm. Um, we thought we could catch them off guard. It was a close match, but they ended up beating us. So after that, it's like, okay, look, we're down, you know, 0-1. We got to win the next two. What can we do? Um, and that, at that point, we're just like, you know, let's let's mix it up. Um, let's run with a comp that, you know, we kind of had this comp where uh, we did kind of plays the flex agent, whether that be Sky or Viper or whatever. Uh, Jordan goes on the smokes, um, and we just, you know, run our confidence play. So that was it, you know, like, Let's let's run the, the confidence comp. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's go in there swinging and just try and catch them off guard. Play a really faster style of play because um, they were kind of beating us in that slow it down mid rounding style. FNS is just he's he's a he's a very good IGO, um, so he's kind of beating <laughs> us in that capacity. So we're like, look, like let's just bring it to your doorstep. Uh, let's run it down on you and see how you can deal with that. And obviously that paid off. Um, this this comp as well has like pure are uh, just playing raise right. No, you didn't play any jet in that in that sort of second uh, time you went up against Envy. Is that part of that confidence comp that that sort of approach, or is it was it like a map specific decision? Because obviously, pure and, and, and jet are quite synonymous at least in the past for you guys. Yeah, pure is a um sort of a special case when it comes to our comps because he's you know he's our exclusive duelist, mm -hmm. um, and a lot of the times we uh run our duelist based on what he's confident on mm. uh, but we've been kind of mixing that up lately with jordan flexing off of the uh raise onto astra um mm. so he's had to kind of pick up raise on certain maps to fill the void where we feel having a, a raise is more important um, than having that jet um so that's one of those you know he he kind of uh has filled that void a lot of the times and at this point he's very confident on the raise now so when the confidence call came in and we were talking bind obviously uh for us raise is, is a bit more valuable on that map and he was very confident sure. on it so we ran it uh psycho so you're telling me when you played against envy it was like okay it's a new comp something they haven't seen before please 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 tell me i'm in the right direction that you know it's a new comp not seen so that means you guys came up with it right you didn't borrow any strats like yinsu saying we're like we we were able to come up with strats can't we uh yeah i mean <laughs> yeah I, I caught a bit of that segment i mean it, it's hard to speculate 
it's, it's hard to speculate you know like we, i got we caught won't know i got until... caught yeah i caught you i caught you um, iceland's coming up in a month right so we're gonna know yeah. pretty soon hopefully right now it's all speculation like we don't really know we can look and say wow that looks really smart it looks like a smart play or that aim looks really snappy that looks like good aim but mm. objectively can we really say you know unless we bring in like the aim labs guys and we're doing combines in a controlled environment and saying okay objectively these guys have better aim than these guys or you know let's bring out the iq test are these guys smarter than these guys we don't we don't know <laughs> like we're not going to know until we play each other um as with any sport it's like traditional sports like national pride comes into it so yeah i want to yeah. say na is going to win you know whether it's us whether it's sentinels bbg who knows who goes to iceland i, I want to see the na team win but we're not going to know until I, it happens i have the bowl ready to drink yinsu and all of europeans <laughs> Or the excess cereal bowl. I mean, I'm actually gonna put Fruit Loops in there too, and just fucking ah. You, you don't, you don't need to do that, man. You're, you're salty enough. You're salty enough. You don't need any more salt. <laughs> um, actually, awesome. I do. I do have a mega quick follow up. Actually, if you okay. did hear the segment we were talking about earlier, because um, when it comes to uh, I want to say stealing, because like everyone is stealing stuff from each other at uh, uh, this moment in time mm -hmm. i know like in the beginning everybody was sort of looking to vision strikers and korea that sort of breached jet meta that they started um are you watching any of the other regions as well and if so as any teams or players caught your eye when it comes to stuff that you also want to kind of adopt into your own arsenal um i do my best to watch all the regions i, I think especially the players too are always looking at other regions uh, looking at their players to see what they can adapt and learn from um, I think that with any new game, as the meta kind of evolves and solidifies, there's going to be, you know, people innovating new things and other people saying, wow, that's cool. I'm going to do that too. And, you know, then it, that's the meta, right? Everybody starts doing it. And then it's like, well, who started it? Who, you know, who's doing it best now, whatever. Um, but I think the thing about being in an early game like this, and especially a game like Valorant with so much utility is there is so much room for innovation as opposed to a game like Counter-Strike that's been out for what a even just go has been out for a decade now people are doing a lot of the, mm -hmm. the same things and when you know astralis does their their diamond pistol stack everybody's like oh my god that's so innovative but it's because you don't really see new things in counter-strike that often so it's really cool to see that yeah. but i feel like mm -hmm. this early in valorant we're seeing new things you know every tournament and it's pretty kind of uh it's kind of cool to see and it's going to be pretty interesting to see you know what becomes dominant later on and i think it will come down to international play to see who stacks up best against each other, what strategies they're running. Which players and teams, I guess, outside of your region has impressed you? I'm just interested. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I really, obviously, it's hard to ignore vision strikers and their, yeah. you know, their winning streak. So is, is that a matter of the region's small and they just got the five best players and they're that much more dominant mm -hmm. or is what they're doing just that crazy? So yeah. again, international play will be interesting to see how they stack up against everybody. But vision strikers, they're... Uh, their set pieces are are really fascinating with how precise they can be. Um, I mean, I, I want to tack onto that as well because I think Xset are known as a team that are like have this uncanny ability to be extremely instinctive in following each other. Um, people have sort of mentioned that, like, you know, quite often you guys go together, right? A lot of times your ex your, your executes are really, um, really well coordinated with all, all five players and. Something that was noted uh, initially, I think, I think it was DDK that pointed it out, and I've been watching now every time I see Xset play on defense, is that your retakes are very snappy, like they're really fast. A lot of teams take a while to find them, or like they just, they just, they dick around a whole bunch there. But I kind of want to know, like, if you've noticed this, or if you feel like that's something that you guys do well, and maybe why you think you're able to be so coordinated as a unit of five, because it, it, it seems so much more coordinated that, that people like even myself can sort of notice it. Um, I think it comes down to a couple of things. Uh, the first being just how we approach practice um, and how we approach strategy in general. Um, a lot of our set pieces aren't like traditional set pieces like you think where you do this at 37 seconds and then you do this at 32 seconds and then you're going to pop out over here. You know, it's, it's more of, you know, practicing like what we want to accomplish um, and getting repetitions in and then uh, really putting in a lot of review time to look back and say, you know, step by step are these decisions the right decisions are is there a, a decision you could have made or a, a place a position you could have taken that would have given you a higher percentage chance of winning that round um, we try to just really approach each of these things uh, methodically so that the next time we're in that situation 
we kind of know what to do. So a lot of um, a lot of our chemistry and uh, fundamentals have really been solidified over these last few months of really just ingraining this stuff in practice and uh, making sure everybody's on the same page consistently. As for the fast retakes, um, sorry, I'm trying to think of how to approach this without, you know, giving too giving much away your strats. Right? Of course, yeah, yeah. of course, of course. Um, but you agree, right? You do agree that you feel like you're able to, to pull that off more than oh, other teams. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think it's something we were kind of forced into with the cons we were playing, uh, as well as the opponents we were playing. And uh, it, it just comes down to, you know, the team we we're playing at the time as well, if we're going to be doing that or not, because some teams okay. are really good at getting onto the site um, and establishing a post plant. And some teams really like to burn all their utility and get onto the site and then suck at the post plant. So uh, <laughs> it's just really a matter of whether we want to get onto that site and disrupt what they're doing and preparing for, or if we want to kind of wait and get all our guys in there and, be ready for a full on assault together. Yeah, not sure. Well, well, speaking of suck, um, I always like to ask like, about different agents and stuff like that with uh, with uh, coaches. And I know we've already talked about Astra already now, but I actually want to ask about Astra going into two point oh seven with literally her gravity well, where you could actually pull out uh, uh, spike diffusers now off the off the diffuse. And also with your, your current thoughts about Yoru, for example, in current patch 2.06, do you see any, uh, for Yoru, do you see any viability? For Astra, do you think she's going to be more broken? Um, I already see Astra as like, she brings so much more valuable, or so much more value mm. than any of the other controllers at the moment. Um, I mean, Omen's the only other viable one as the solo controller on most maps. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so making her stronger, obviously, Seems like a step in the opposite direction of where it, it needs to be. Obviously, I want her to stay where she is because I like uh, crafting strategy <laughs> around where she is right now. And if you're going to give yeah. me the opportunity to to let her player pull somewhat off the, the bomb in a in a, a defuse situation, then yeah, I'll take that and run with it. But um, <laughs> I, I think at that point we need to look at Brimstone and say, what does his impact do if Astra has an ability True. that pulls people off of the bomb plant or the bomb defuse? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is it is kind of a power creep, you know. And I think some of the initial agents suffer from that because sometimes you just, there's only so much you can scale up a concept. Like, how do you scale up uh, Stimpak to make it competitive, you know, or to make it compete with, you know, something like the the the, the suck, so to speak. Mm -hmm. You know, they do mm -hmm. different things. There's only so much <laughs> Why do we have to do. call it that? <laughs> it's called the suck. That's what That's we, call, we it. call it in North America. Oh you're not, you're not going to force these players to call it anything else when they're communicating <laughs> with each other. So you might as well just embrace it. Oh. <laughs> oh. All right. So uh, here's the, I don't know if you have an opinion on this, um, but I'm kind of curious. There's like Sick posted a tweet the other day um, talking about six man rosters and how he feels like they can actually be kind of like a negative to because of the pressure that the player mm -hmm. sort of feels. And we're actually seeing like a, a few of these six player rosters crop up now. Uh, some of them are just like it just sometimes we're just seeing the, that six player just leave, um, uh, uh, you know, eventually, right? I want I want your take on this. Do you think it makes sense? Do you think there's a place for it right now? You you particularly have a team with people like we did who just plays fucking everything. So maybe you don't need a sub, but I'd love to know your thoughts on six player rosters in general in Valorant. Sure. So let's look at like current six man rosters, at least in NA. Mm -hmm. um, I think one is NRG, um, okay. and I think their six man is infinite. But I think like that's like a special situation. Like he's got some stuff going mm -hmm. on. He had some weird publicity thing he was dealing with. So I don't know if that was like still contracted but we're pushing him to the shadows and we're building a different team whatever yes. and then you have tsm right and then uh their situation is you know we we've been struggling to perform despite our pedigree um and so at that point i feel like they were pressured to make a roster change but you don't want to cut one of your people so you just bring someone else in i don't know mm -hmm. the status of that um they played with brax that first run didn't qualify and then they played with the original five this next run and qualified so i don't know mm -hmm. What does that mean for Brax? Who knows? I think six man is is hard to do in this game versus like Counter Strike, where the roles are a little bit more malleable. You can play one role one round and one role another round. Whereas in this game, you're locking into an agent, so you're kind of committing to that role. Mm -hmm. um, and like you hinted at, if if you're a six man, you got to be flexible uh, to fill a variety of roles. So you need to know how to play all those agents. So definitely brings added challenges for six man rosters in Valorant. I don't think I personally would run with that. Because there's okay. also the aspect, um, you know, it's a weird power dynamic. I feel like that's what Sick was referencing. Like someone's yep. always 
you know, kind of feeling left out of the group or, you know, who's deciding who's playing? Is it the coach, the manager, the, the IGL? The captain, is, yeah, yeah. Is yeah. the team taking votes? And at that point, is it like Survivor, the reality show? Are you like making friends with your other teammates <laughs> to make sure you can play the match that weekend? You know, it's... Alliance, know, immunity. Yeah, who is the immunity idol this week? <laughs> okay, that, yeah, that makes sense. And that, that very much lines up, I think, um, from with what Seek was sort of saying as well. It's just kind of an, an, an extra element of like social complexity added to uh you know being in a team which is like you, mm -hmm. you kind of you, you want to prune these off ideally you want to be you know as, as streamlined as possible as you can be um so obviously you're in the challenges finals uh obviously challenges are a little bit different this time around and you're gonna have a double elimination bracket top two teams go to masters uh, i'd love to know how you're feeling going into that in advance and obviously if you win your first match you're playing against envy again <laughs> so so yeah, getting pretty used to going up against them. I'd love to, you know, just before we, we wrap up and, and, and let you go and do your thing, I just wanted to get a take on, you know, what to expect from, from Xset and how you guys are feeling. I think we're feeling pretty good. It's obviously a huge advantage to have this much time to prepare. Um, mm. And it's just like a privacy aspect as well, right? We can test new things and not be watched by 100,000 people on the Nerd Street Gamers broadcast. So um, that's obviously an advantage. And then inversely, we can watch these other teams. It gives us a good counter striding mm -hmm. edge. Um, I think it'll be good for us, uh, obviously. And I, I feel really good going into it. Um, are we going to get top two? I don't know. Um, mm -hmm. I want to say yes, obviously. I think the guys are all ready for it. We're all ready to go to Iceland. Uh, I got my passport last week. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> we're, we're ready to go. Uh, we're ready to compete against these guys and see how we can do on the international stage. So, um, I'm sure Finesse is looking at that bracket like, oh, got these guys again, right? Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> He'll have some stuff uh, ready I've... for us. We'll have some stuff ready for him. Oh, man, I can't wait. I mean, I think, yeah, obviously, you guys have just made a lot of fans out of the Valorant community over the last 100%. few months. So congratulations for how you, you know, yourself personally and also the team have been able to sort of, yeah, again, conquer a lot of the challenges of a very rapidly shifting metagame and a game that's obviously very young. So we uh, we look forward to it. Thank you so much, Psycho, for giving us your time, man, and, and uh, all the best for you guys in the Challenges Finals. Thank you so much, Woo. guys. I appreciate it.